We're going to go into Texas independence, leaving starting up where we left off the other day with uh, Texans settling in Mexican territory, Mexican Texas, uh, which hopefully leads us into the Bear Flag Republic, meaning that two of our biggest states will ultimately become countries before they become states. And your assignment is to continue to work on the study guide. If you're at home suffering from COVID, I hope you're all feeling well. Everybody say hi to my COVID people. Hi. Yeah, they were really excited to say hi to you. They don't love you like I do. All right, so get better and come back to school. Watch videos. All right, so that leads us into uh, exactly where we left off on uh, the last class period. Which is just one slide past this. We were taking a look at Mexico making the decision to give away lands to Americans in Mexican Texas. The whole idea was, if they give away this free land in Mexican Texas, that Americans would love the land so much and love the country so much that they would ultimately eventually become Mexicans. So if they were worried that Americans might come in and take away Mexico, or Mexican territory in Texas, because there weren't really any Mexicans there to defend it, uh, and they didn't know what to do, so they decided to give it to Americans great idea. If we look at our pattern in history, I guess maybe it's not fair to characterize Mexico as making a big mistake here because they wouldn't have necessarily known what we know, but our pattern in history sort of dictates that when there's something that America wants, we take it, we go get it. We even have that attitude today. We're, uh, Americans are very goal-oriented, whereas people in a lot of countries are satisfied with where they're at and what they're doing. Uh, we all set goals. A lot of you don't want to be exactly what your parents are. In a lot of countries, in a lot of places, it's just an accepted standard that if uh, my mother is a hairdresser, I'll be a hairdresser. I don't know what your goals are, but I uh, am not anything of what my parents were. So uh, when we set goals, we tend to go out and achieve them. If your goal is to get all A's, you probably press yourself a little harder to get all A's. If you're satisfied just with passing, then you're okay with just passing. So we're very goal-oriented, and when we want something, we take it, and we've got that whole manifest destiny thing that's pushing us in the direction because God said it's all right to control from them. That's what they believe, that by giving it to Americans, they would maintain control. Uh, sort of like if we said, uh, Christian, I don't trust you to run my class, so uh, here's the remote and the microphone. You go ahead and run my class. My assumption being that if I give him a little bit of, if I show confidence that he can do it, that he'll actually do a good job of it. How do you think that's going to turn out, people? It's not going to go really well. If Christian starts doing karaoke and singing lots of weird Abba songs, he's got the microphone, and he's like, Ooh, I love the Lord. And then Kelson jumps up and starts singing with him with his broken pinky toe, and it starts getting weird really fast, and nothing happens that was supposed to happen. So I only have a few requirements. Just teach what's on the slides, Christian. And don't let Wyatt go to the bathroom more than once. And keep your eyes on Grace because she'll start gaming. Those are very simple requirements. And then pretty soon, what do you know? He's like, well, I don't want to do these slides. What if we watch a funny TikTok video? I'll fire up Mr. B's computer and we'll watch. Okay, so uh, Wyatt's got to pee 14 times while he's actually in the hallway meeting up with the girl behind the lockers. And, go, ooh, 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 ooh. and of course, Grace is playing solitaire, like always. I'll come and help. Yeah, well, it is. So, what do we got to do? We got to learn Spanish. Uh, well, I guess I shouldn't put it up there. I should ask you. We got to learn Spanish what are, look, without looking at your screens. What are the other two requirements to get free land in Mexican Texas? Really? You are a little slow? Okay. Well, I guess we're in a good spot. So, all right. So, let's see. Avalon, if I said one year from now, so on January 25th, 2023, 
if you can speak fluent Spanish, meaning blah, 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 you can talk to Victor's dad, square up talking to him, conversing with him. You can speak fluent Spanish, I'll give you a million dollars. Uh, Are you up for the challenge? Heck yeah, I don't think anybody would probably decline that. Now, some of us would fail, but I'll tell you, if someone offered me that kind of scratch, because I've tried learning Spanish and I'm not very good at it, but my incentive was uh, a grade in college. So I did good enough to get the grade that I was hoping for, but I didn't learn any Spanish, just some vocab words. So if I was talking to Victor's dad, I might catch a few words, but I'm probably not going to be able to have the conversation. So, uh, yeah, but for a million bucks, that's incentive for free land and beautiful free land with tall grasses and, and good weather and a long growing season and woo. Heck yeah, I'll give it a shot. You stop watching TV and listening to the radio and you, uh, you go to Rosetta Stone and start hanging out with Carlos. Because that's what we do. We're given a challenge. So, yeah, I'll do that. That one sounds hard. It is hard. Uh, and that's one that you guys are going to have to start considering. Uh, in the next month or so, in about a month, we do high school registration. I don't know how it's going to be different this year than it's ever been, so I'll tell the truth, that's what we're going to do for the time being. But you'll have to make decisions like, for instance, am I taking Spanish next year? Most, almost most, colleges require two years of foreign language, and the only foreign language we offer at high school is Spanish. So if you're planning to go to college, you have to factor in sometime in your four years of high school, you're going to have to have two years of Spanish. You have to do it when you're a freshman. Well, you can wait till you're a junior if you want to. But I'll tell you, the majority of the students that are in the class will be freshmen. Because if you wait till you're a junior, most of the other students in there are going to be, what is today, the sixth graders, which doesn't really mean anything. It just means in high school, you intermingle with other classes, so it's kind of nice that way. Uh, so that's going to be a consideration that you're going to have to decide on. And, and sometimes they'll try to convince you to take four years of Spanish. If you're really good at it after four years, you might not have to take it in college. Uh, you may be kept out of it. So uh, there's some benefits to it. But taking high school Spanish doesn't mean you're going to learn how to speak Spanish. Uh, when I go to Mexico, I know how to ask how to use or where the bathroom Actually, that's not true. I don't even know how to ask where the bathroom is. I just put my shoulders up like this, and I say, Ponzo. And then the Mexican guy points and goes, over there, senor, or whatever. You know, like, gotcha, bro. And I take off and go to the baño, which is the bathroom. So I know a few words, but I don't know how to say, where is the bathroom? I just shrug my shoulders and say, baño. It works. Just like if a, a Mexican guy that didn't speak any English said, bathroom? Yeah, that would kind of sound weird, though. How do we get there? Well, you don't need to know the whole language all the time. Shelby? How to ask? Yeah. Largest spaniel? Sometimes they just look at Anyway, so learn Espanol. We got this. Okay, number two, you got to become Catholic. Now, some of you are like, oh, no big deal. I'm already Catholic. Victor's like, huh, I know some Spanish, and I'm Catholic. This freelance stuff's going to be easy peasy. I'm not Catholic. But remember, we go through these time periods in history when religion is like, woo, really important in times when religion is. This just happens to be a, nah. And the people looking for the free land mostly didn't care. And even if they did, ah, this is a jackpot. Again, for a million dollars, would you change religion? Maybe. You're a little worried that God might be upset. But here's the thing. I'm Lutheran. They're saying become Catholic. In Mexico, there's a national religion. You don't even have to go to it. Um, like a lot of countries have a national language. We don't even have that. So, uh, become Catholic. I'm Lutheran. So I start questioning. Am I 
going to get in trouble if I switch to Catholicism. I've been to the Catholic Church quite a few times because my nephews and nieces are Catholic, so when they go through their whatever ceremonies, uh, I go. And there's a lot of chanting, and then there's some kneeling and some standing and some singing, and I have no idea what's going on, but if I went a half a dozen times, I'd probably be like, I got this. So I start questioning. Is it the same God? I'm a Lutheran. Victor's a Catholic. Do we pray to the same God, Victor? Yeah, it's the same guy. Uh, is it the same Bible? Yes, it is. So the only difference between our two churches is interpretation. Since the Bible is thousands of years old, and anybody that's tried to read it knows that it's kind of hard to read. It just means that people over those hundreds and thousands of years have interpreted the meaning of God's word in the Bible differently. So am I willing to accept somebody else's interpretation? If I'm in the man stage and religion isn't that important and uh, I don't really care, okay, I'll switch over, whatever. So I've met the first two requirements. I'm going to try really hard to learn Spanish. I'm going to switch over to Catholicism. Number three is super stupid. You have to obey Mexican law. Well, you're, if you're in Mexico, you're going to obey Mexican law. If I'm on vacation in Mexico and I'm driving the rental car and it says 60 kilometers per hour, then I better not go 70 kilometers per hour because it's their law. It doesn't matter, matter what my law is. It doesn't matter that the speed limit here is 99. That's right. You can't go above 99 miles per hour. Well, that's kind of cool. Not 100. That would be pretty cool. I'm just Anyway, okay, booyah, easy peasy. So all these settlers flock into Mexican, Texas. All 25 of us, we head in and we're like, this is great. There's cows just roaming around and all we got to do is grab them and fence them in. It's like $100 bills roaming around on the plane. We're like, woo, booyah, making money without even trying to make money. And the weather is beautiful and there's tall grass and there's wild game to eat. The farming is good. Long growth, everything they advertise is good. In fact, it's so good that I'm like sending letters to my friends and family. I'm like, friends and family, you guys got to come here. This is great. So after a period of years, like say by 1830, there's six Americans in Mexican Texas for every one Mexican. Texas is big. So all of a sudden, the Mexican government is like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What is happening here? It's filling up with the Americans, and the, the Mexicans get nervous, so they send representatives, government representatives, to our settlement. And we all settle together because we know each other and we're comfortable around each other. Some of us like each other better than others. Christian. Who was his name? I didn't say your name. You said my name. That's what it sounds like when I say it. No. No, that's my name. Who would I like more? Christian. Who would I like more? No. What? Anyway, so all of us settle together. We've got our farms together. We're all of us are writing letters to our friends and family. You might even invite your brother. Yeah, maybe not. Okay, so we get our friends and family coming, and the Mexicans show up, and they're like, "Okay, hablo español," and we're like, "No hablo." We didn't learn Spanish. Why not? There wasn't anybody there to teach us Spanish, and there wasn't anybody there to make sure we were learning Spanish. So I told Avalon, in a year, you have to know how to speak Spanish, and I'll give you a million dollars. But if I don't show up after a year, I have no reason to do it. She might be upset that she doesn't have a million dollars, but maybe the check just automatically deposited in her bank account. She's like, yes! And I didn't have to speak Spanish. So we don't speak Spanish. They're like, ah! Waving their arms around. Because, again, I think the people that are frustrated probably just flail their arms around wildly. And then they're like, okay, fine. Where's the Catholic Church? Oh, we didn't build one. We were busy farming. And there aren't any Catholic priests to teach us the word. 
So we don't speak Spanish, we're not Catholic, and they're like, fine, waving their arms, flailing wildly. How about what kind of laws are you following here? We don't even know the Mexican laws because there aren't any Mexicans around to tell us the Mexican laws. So what kind of laws do you think we're following in Mexican Texas? Because we have to have laws no matter where we go. <coughs> American laws that we're familiar with. So we're not going to use kilometers per hour. We're going to use miles per hour when we're riding on a horse. Because we're familiar with miles per hour. We're much more comfortable with that. Someday when you're riding in your car, one of your smart hour kids is going to switch your miles per hour gauge over to kilometers per hour because most cars will do that. And you're like, whoa, what's going on? I'm going 90 and really you're only going 40 miles an hour or something like that. I don't know what the degrees of Celsius there. And then you slow way down and your cars are passing you. Wait, that's kilometers per hour. So, yeah, we don't do any of those things. So the Mexicans get upset, and they say, no more settlement. Because we didn't do any of the things we that they had asked. So their plan is backfiring on them. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You can't shut off settlement because I already invited my cousins and my brother, and, and I even invited Kate's brother. I said, Drew, you should come here. He's like, I don't know, Kate's not going to want me there. I said, I don't care. Come here anyway. Uh, so I got people coming, and the Mexican government just said, no more. We got issues, people. So what Mexico thought would happen, that all of us would be so grateful that we gave them this great land that we follow their three simple rules, uh, backfires. Mexico fills up. Texas fills up with Americans. Now there's going to have to be a brew. By the way, this is not a political stance of mine. I just like to point this out because I think it's kind of ironic. For Americans to go settle in Mexico, right? Americans were going and settling in Mexico. We had to do these three things. If a Mexican wants to come to America and settle, do they have to learn English? Do they have to conform to any kind of religious stuff? Yes. So we only require one of those three things for settlement in America. And even then, a lot of those, and it's not just Mexicans, but those sneaking across the Mexican border into the United States, many of them aren't Mexican. They're actually from El Salvador and Honduras and other Central American countries. Uh, they're not obeying American law because they're illegally coming into our country. So we look at uh, Victor's family, who is here legally. They don't have to meet any of those requirements we set all of American law and do it the steps that are taken to come into the United States legally. Uh, there's a difference. So, uh, no more Americans, they say. And Americans are like, ha ha, you can't stop us. So, we're going to have a little war. But this war isn't going to be between the United States and Mexico, it's between Texas and Mexico. The United States is like, uh, Not our problem. We don't want war with Mexico, even though it's a war that's very, very winnable. Wars mean dead Americans. They always mean dead Americans. Even if you're just unloading the tank off of a, a, a truck or a, a, a plane that carries tanks, uh, someone gets run over, dies. Wars with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of men mean death. So, no, America doesn't want to do this. So, Texas, you're on your own, basically. Uh, the guy's picture here, he's the evil dictator of Mexico. I'm pretty sure in world history last year with Mr. LeGrand, he studied what is a dictator. Give me a super <laughs> simple instruction on dictator and you'll give me a great way to explain it. What is it? Usually himself or herself. And their buddies. Yeah, that's a good description. Yeah. Do we usually think of dictators as good leaders or good people? Almost never. Maybe one or two dictators have really done some good work with their people. Now, it's different than a monarchy, but some monarchs, like kings and queens, can be dictator like, and yet some are also benevolent, which means they're really good to their people. So if you look at the 
the history of England, they've had some really, really bad kings and queens in their past, and they've had some kings and queens that really did look out for the good of their people and the strength of their country. So we're going to go to war. This is uh, General Santa Anna. He's the Mexican dictator. He's got some military experience, done a little fighting. Uh, Santa Anna is not his uh, real name. In fact, uh, it's something kind of cool about Mexican names is they carry their family tree. So Santa Anna is like the abbreviation for his name. Um, our names carry part of our family tree. Like, for instance, 100 years from now, if somebody's studying me, they know that my father's name and my grandfather's name on my father's side is Bella. But in our culture, we lose, almost always lose, our maternal side. The mother's name isn't anywhere in my name. So Santa Ana's real name was Antonio de Padua Severino Lopez de Santa Ana y Perez de Lebron. That's his whole name. So do you understand why he goes by Santa Ana? Santa Ana, Lopez de Santa Ana, is his paternal name. That means it's his father's name. Uh, Perez de Lebron will be his mother's name. So the whole family tree is right there in his name. That's why he shortens it to Santa Ana, because when he signs the check, he can't fit Antonio de Padua Severino Lopez de Santa Ana Perez de Lebron. Can't fit all of that. Anyway, that's a typical, normal Mexican name. If you have family in Mexico, any of them have like gigantic names like that? Like have multiple names in their name? It's a cultural thing. And I don't know if that's a, if it remains as a normal part of Mexico. kind of cool. I, I sort of wish we did that, though. Sometimes I have trouble learning people's first names. Anyway, so Santa Ana sends soldiers to put down this rebellion in Texas. In fact, he decides to lead the soldiers to put down this rebellion in Texas. Uh, he takes about 6,000 soldiers uh, heading off to Texas. Now, as soon as the Texas their farmers and ranchers in Texas find out that Santa Ana is on his way. They decide, oh my God, OMG, SMH, we better do something to stop this guy or he's going to take away everything we've got. This is a real army, a country's real army that just got done fighting this skirmish war against the Spanish. Santa Ana has some experience. His, his men know how to fight. They're supported by a country. The Texas rebels, because they're rebelling <laughs> against the Mexicans, have no experience, and they're a bunch of farmers. This shouldn't really be a matchup. Now, they're fighting at home for home on their own territory, or what they see as their territory. So they have some advantages, but Santa Ana should be able to crush any sort of dissent that's in his path. So the Texans know they're in trouble, so they really quickly uh, find a leader. And there's a leader by the name of Sam Houston. Sam Houston says, I need time to build a Texican army. All right, so we can call them Texicans, Texans, or Texians. History books all use different names. It doesn't matter. It's the Texas rebels. So Sam Houston says, give me time. So he has a group of volunteers, a small group of volunteers, that start hanging out in a, in a church near what is today San Antonio. Anybody ever been to San Antonio? All right, I'm not a huge Texas fan. My wife, when we first got married, said, let's move to Texas. And I said, no. Now, as I hate, as I get older, I hate cold weather more and more. And I'm like, yeah, we should have moved to Texas. Anyway, I've been to San Antonio three times. It is a really neat city. The Alamo used to be in the middle of the countryside surrounded by nothingness. Today, it's swallowed up by a city. I'll show you pictures of the Alamo in a minute. It's still there. But the Alamo was a small Spanish mission, meaning it was a Catholic church 
it's got a probably an eight or nine foot tall adobe wall that's probably three feet thick around it for safety, not to protect it like in military instances, but to protect the, the monks or the priests inside from potential um, hostile Native Americans. So it looks like a fortress, but it is a church with a wall around it and barracks, which just means bunks or places for men to sleep, for the monks that lived there that were spreading religion. It's going to become a fortress. So a group of men inhabit the Alamo with the goal of slowing down Santa Ana in San Antonio to give uh, Sam Houston up north a little bit of time to build an army. The goal at the Alamo is not to defeat the Mexicans. It's just to slow them down. That's all. So uh, the guy that's in charge at the Alamo, his name is William Travis. He's like a 24-year-old man. Uh, he's the most senior officer in the place. There are some other people that are in the Alamo that are pretty famous. Uh, there's a guy named James Bowie. If you've heard that last name before, uh, maybe you're a knife collector. James Bowie was like the probably the greatest knifesman in America. Like if you get in a fight with this guy and he has a knife, just run because he's going to kill you. He's really good fighting with knives. Uh, and he develops his own special knife called a Bowie knife, which is just basically a, a big, bladed, heavy-duty knife. So he could hack you up. There's another guy that's famous, uh, Davy Crockett. You might have heard that. There's songs about Davy Crockett from the Wild Frontier, those little karaoke. Yeah. Right. Um, Davy Crockett was a Native there's a whole bunch of words, but I don't think I'll go. Anyway, uh, Davy Crockett was a stud. This guy was a, an outdoorsman, a mountain man in the Appalachians, a trailblazer. And as he got older, he decided that he should run for a, a Senate for the state of Tennessee. So he served in the Senate in Washington, D.C., thought everybody liked him, ran for re-election and lost. So Davy Crockett says, to hell with Tennessee. I'm going to Texas. The old man looking for adventure. So he's inside the Alamo with William Travis and James Bowie and a bunch of other unnamed young men, women, and old men. Most of them had cleared out. Texas declares independence, just like America declared independence. You're not independent until you win independence. So Texas says, we're free. Uh, Sam Houston is in command. 180 to 200 Americans are hanging out in the Alamo. There's anywhere between 1,800 and 6,000 Mexican soldiers. Now here's the thing. Santa Ana is a very, uh, what's the word that means uh, uh, cocky, uh, arrogant. He's a very arrogant man, and he makes a stupid critical mistake here. Remember, the job of the men in the Alamo is to slow him down. They know they're probably going to get defeated. I don't know that they know they're all going to die. But the 120 men, 180 men Americans inside the Alamo, uh, they just hope that Santa Ana stops. Santa Ana marches up to the Alamo near San Antonio, and he's like, oh, Americans, aren't they cute? Let's destroy them. All he would have had to do, because there aren't even really any soldiers inside this place. Most of them are just ordinary people. Many of them are already sick because they're not getting any fresh water. There's a river that runs nearby, but if they leave the safety of the Alamo, they get shot. So they're sick, uh, starvation is setting in. All Santa Ana would have had to do is, oh, there's the Alamo. Let's just go around it. Let's go find Sam Houston and destroy him. Instead, he's marched a long ways, so Santa Ana decides to set up camp outside the Alamo, a couple hundred meters away. They don't have any cannon or anything inside the Alamo, so they can't do anything about it but watch. He's kind of holding them under siege. And, and after 12 days of camping out, he sends up what's called a blood red flag. If you raise a blood red flag, flags are symbolic for all sorts of reasons. A blood red flag means uh, uh, we're fixing to attack and we're going to kill you all. We're taking no prisoners. So Santa Ana is getting ready to storm the Alamo. And the men inside know that it's coming. 
and the order is given by William Travis for anyone to clear out that can't be there, they all stay. So they're way outnumbered. We've got 18, at least 1,800 uh, to 180. There's 10 Mexicans for every one American or every one Texan inside this place. On the 13th day, he storms the Alamo, raising a blood red flag. Uh, all but a handful of Texans are killed. And they're allowed to live. A uh, thousand plus Mexicans die. So did the men inside the Alamo do their job? Yeah. Davy Crockett is killed. William Travis is killed. Uh, Jim Jim Bowie was sick. He didn't even fight in the battle to save the Alamo. He had dysentery. Uh, you can't really fight when you're pooping like constantly, and there's water running out of your rear end. So he's laying in bed when they. Went to clean out the Alamo. They found Jim Bowie's body laying in a bed, surrounded by 16 Mexican corpses. So in the process of getting killed, well, sick, potentially he killed 16 men. They allowed, uh, uh, Santa Ana allowed uh, one man, a, a black man, who was a slave to William Travis, to escape. And maybe a woman and a couple of children. This part of the story gets sketchy. But Santa Ana allows them to live, and he says, you need to go north and find your leader, Sam Houston, and tell him what happened here, thinking that it would scare Sam Houston. Instead, how do we feel when we find out that this Santa Ana guy just slaughtered a whole bunch of old men that were sick and women and children? Dirty coward. Let's get payback. It wasn't that the Texians were afraid. It's that now they're angry and they want payback for what's happened to their people. So uh, they did exactly what they were supposed to do and sacrificed themselves. Now, was Santa Ana pure evil? Uh, no. Mostly, yes. But after the Battle of the Alamo, there were some orphan children that were alive. Santa Ana offered to adopt them. Uh, they declined. Because it was a really nice life being the, the child of the dictator of Mexico, but they're like, nah, you cold-blooded murderer. So this guy's a villain in history. But they go find Sam Houston, they're like, oh my gosh, Sam Houston, you should have seen it, it was a slaughter, there was blood and diarrhea everywhere, it was crazy, oh my god. And Sam Houston's army is like, okay, we shall get revenge, and their rallying cry becomes, remember the Alamo. So anytime those men start to feel like, I don't know, we can win. remember the Alamo. Okay, um, recent or more recent American history. When uh, we're fighting terrorists around the world, what do we need to remind ourselves when we start wondering if we're doing the right thing? Our rallying cry would be, remember 9-11. And then we get this new resolve to go out and attack the terrorists that might try to do that to us again. It doesn't take a whole lot to remind us why we're upset. That's our rally cry. So uh, this is a picture of the front gates of the Alamo. There's actually a fence right here. If you go inside, it is just a church. And then the barracks of the Alamo would surround this big square adobe wall. You can actually still see bullet holes in the adobe wall if you I was disappointed, but I usually am disappointed when I go to places like this because I'm all jacked up and geeked up about the history aspect. And then when you get there, it's really, really tourist, which that's a moneymaker for the city of San Antonio. There's very few who like to see this. Uh, and here's Santa Ana. Good looking dude with lots of medals. I think maybe he was uh, uh, friends with uh, uh, Samuel Morse. each other a little bit crazy and got some medals. I don't know who you want, Samuel Morris or Samuel Morris is kind of a good name. Anyway, there's a full name right away. So, actually, I'm going to back up. There's a battle that takes place. So this isn't as, as short and simple a war as history books make it seem. There's a battle that takes place called uh, Goliad on March 27, 1836. 
the Mexicans <laughs> march into this village of Goliath, which is pretty much undefended. They capture 425 Texans, and they shoot them in the head point blank. So they line them up on the ground after having them dig a ditch, that's the ditch for their bodies, and shoot them in the head. Uh, anyone that survived was clubbed or knifed to death. The colonel that was in Goliath of the uh, uh, Texian soldiers, his name was uh, Colonel Fannin. He was the last man to be executed, so he was forced to watch all of his people get slaughtered. These Mexicans that are doing this killing in this war are as cold as it comes. doesn't matter, women, children, old men, they'll kill you all. They're trying to make a point, don't mess with Mexico. Colonel Fannin, uh, because he's a colonel, they sit him in a chair making him watch this thing. And then they said, all right, we're going to kill you. You can make three requests. Well, this is kind of nice. And sometimes uh, militaries or armies do this for each other for officers. And since Colonel Fannin is a colonel, the uh, Mexican officers are like, we're going to give you three requests as you die. Uh, his first request was, uh, make sure, please, that all my possessions go to my family. So my credit card, my wallet, my driver's license. Make sure all my money and, and all my stuff, please send it back to my family. Here's my address. <clears throat> the Mexicans say, okay, that's fair. We respect that. His second request was, uh, shoot me in the heart, not the face. I don't know if Colonel Bannon was like a pretty man or what. He's like, don't shoot me in the face. That's rude. They're like, okay, I'll respect that. And his third request was, uh, please give me a Christian burial. He's not asking for anything special. <clears throat> He's not asking for even special treatment that his other men should receive. They're like, okay. So what did they do? They stole all his stuff, shot him in the face, and burned him in a body pile. Stories get back to Sam Houston and Sam Houston's men and what happened in Goliath. This is a bigger slaughter than what happened at the Alamo. It's getting worse and worse. 28 people escaped from Goliath in this great mistake that we tell in the story. So we end up at a place called San Jacinto. And by this time, remember, Sam Houston's whole goal was to train a Texian army of farmers how to be kind of soldiers. And they're angry now. They've got reason to fight. So the, the Mexicans have given them the spark that Sam Houston really needed them to have. And they've got time. So the Alamo and the Goliath, the, the people of Goliath, slowed the Mexican army down just enough. On April 21st, so about a month after Goliath, they arrive in San Jacinto. So this is a showdown between Sam Houston, the leader of the Texican rebels, and Santa Ana, the leader of the Mexicans. The Texians are able to attack the Mexicans when they're ill-prepared, so they're not ready for attack. The Battle of San Jacinto is ferocious and fierce and short. It lasts a total of 18 minutes. In that 18 minutes, 630 Mexican soldiers are killed, 730 Mexican soldiers are captured, nine Texans die. The Battle of San Jacinto is sort of like the definition of a bomb whooping. Nine Texans are killed and either 1,360 Mexicans are killed or captured. This is exactly what Sam Houston wanted. So at this point, he knows that Santa Ana is either dead or captured. But Santa Ana was a bit of a coward, and he took off his fancy general uniform, and he hid himself amongst the regular men, wearing just a regular Mexican army uniform. So you got a picture the, the Texans have all these Mexican soldiers sitting on this field crisscross applesauce, and they've been disarmed, and maybe their hands are even tied together, and, and the Texicans are walking around looking for General Santa Ana. They can't find him. Sam Houston, by the way, has been shot in the leg, so he's in a field hospital somewhere. He's not going to die, but he's been wounded, so he's like, Argh. so his men are walking around, and, and, and 700 Mexican soldiers are sitting crisscross applesauce on a football field, and all of a sudden, one of Sam Houston's men hears across the field a little ways, someone say something about the Generalissimo. Oh, you know where the General is. Where is Santa Ana? No, I'll blow in blanks. Let's try this again. Where is Santa Ana? You're like, right there. Oh, General. 
General Santa Anna. It's good to finally meet you, you sneaky coward. Yes, you said you. So, Santa Anna, let me go get uh, Colonel Houston, General Sam Houston. So they go get Houston out of the medical tent. Houston comes hobbling over. He's like, nice to meet you, Santa Anna, you filthy animal. Kill all those innocent people at the Alamo and at Goliath. So Sam Houston says to Santa Anna, I got a paper I need you to sign. It's a surrender document. It also states that Texas has won its independence. So he puts this paper in front of Santa Anna, who is refusing to speak any English, whether he spoke any English or not. And I'm sure Sam Houston has interpreters at this point. So he's like, sign it, put your name on here. It admits that Texas wins and Texas is independent. And Santa Anna says, I'm not going to sign that. It's like West Picture Blue, and that guy's got it on the cross with the face grip across half a sock. And Santa, uh, Sam Houston says, oh, well, let's try it a little bit different. And he cocks his pistol, and he sticks it in Santa Anna's head. What do you think Santa Anna does? Signs. Signs the document. Texas has just won independence from Mexico <laughs> at the Battle of San Jacinto. There were sacrifices, men died, but the rallying cry, remember the Alamo, kept them going. Uh, by December of 1836, Texas becomes the Lone Star Republic. It is a country. You look at a Texas flag, it's red, white, blue, and it has one star on it. That was their country's flag. Um, what happens to Santa Ana and his men? They're released. Santa Ana's like, wee, 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 all the way home. Goes running back to Mexico City, and he's like, "Baby, hey, 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 do it!" Now the Mexicans in Mexico City are ticked off that they just lost a huge chunk of their territory to this group of Texian rebels. They blame Santa Ana. They kick him out of office, throw him in jail. Santa Ana spends three years in jail, gets out of jail, and then he becomes the dictator again. The Mexican government was a train wreck of a mess at that time. Anyway, back to America. Texas is a country, and they're like, hey, America, we got our independence now. Can we please be a state? Because they've met that magical population number of 60,000. Can we please be a state? And the American government says, um, yeah, I don't think so. What? We're all Americans. We want to be America. We don't want to be a country. By the way, could Texas be a country based on its size? They don't want to be a country, they want to be America. So America's hesitant. Why do you think America's hesitant to make Texas a country? Say that again. That's a good point. It's remote and it's got to be defended. Who are we going to take off if we accept Texas or annex Texas? You know they've just been defeated by a group of rebels. America doesn't need any more enemies. So Texas is on hold for a while. Not very long, but for a while. It's eventually, obviously, going to become a state. Uh, but their request is denied. Partly because of that balance of slave versus free state. Mexico had already declared slavery in the late 1830s, and Texas had slavery. Actually, really like the Texas flag because it has a slave history. Well, I think Nebraska should be the Iron Arm flag because nobody can really tell what it is. It's just like a blue flag with a red cross on it. I don't think it's nice. I don't think wrong is the Nebraska flag. I don't think it's wrong. Well, that we know. If I said draw the Texas flag, Here's my proposal. We recreate the American the Nebraska state flag, and we'll make it uh, like lime green or, or bright yellow, maybe I like it. And we'll just put a picture of me on it. That would represent Nebraska. Or use like the Nebraska hand or something like that. Well, that's pretty cool. Something. We're going to allow Texas in.
there's kind of a fun fact I like this. Santa Ana actually had a, a fake leg, a prosthetic leg, um, made out of wood mostly. He lost it in a fight against the French a few years later. I don't know why he was fighting the French. This is a little history that I'm not very familiar with. Uh, he had a state funeral. Eventually, uh, protesters dug it up and dug it through the street. Um, at one point, he was in Chicago in a carriage. Now, I don't know that. I don't understand the full history of this, what Santa Ana, evil dictator of Mexico, was doing in Chicago in 1847. Um, <laughs> he, he abandons his leg. So I'm not really sure how this works. In a carriage... In 1847, a group of soldiers attack. You got a picture of Santa Ana sitting in the back of a horse and car horse drawn carriage, eating a bucket of KFC, because there's a half eaten chicken, and eighteen thousand dollars worth of gold. Uh, they attack the carriage. I don't get this at all. Santa Ana abandons his prosthetic leg, bucket of chicken, and eighteen thousand dollars. So what is he like hopping down the street on one leg? And how do they not capture him? That doesn't make any sense. So the story is a little bit sketchy. But anyway, his leg is in a museum in Springfield, Illinois. And both Texas and Mexico want it. Texas thinks they have a claim to it because of their history with Santa Ana. And obviously Mexico wants it back too. But um, that is Santa Ana's fake leg in a museum in Springfield, Illinois. doesn't look very comfortable when you see the cause of the body. Maybe. Like, I get a better one later. We've got a dispute with Oregon and, and the, the push for our manifest destiny. How am I doing for time here? 12 minutes. I'm in the top. Let me give me four and then I'll move over here. So the United States and Great Britain both claim Oregon territory. Now, here's the problem. At one point, Oregon Territory was actually claimed by five separate countries. So the United States and Great Britain thought it was ours. We thought it was ours because uh, we were already there because of the Oregon Trail. And really, your claim to territory has something to do with who's there first. The British believed it was theirs because they controlled Canada. At one point, Russia claimed Oregon Territory, but they gave up claims to Oregon Territory without any kind of fight because most of Russia is uh, thousands of miles away from Oregon Territory, so they couldn't get there. At one point, the Spanish claimed Oregon Territory, and at one point, Mexico claimed Oregon Territory. So the dispute now has kind of rattled out, and everyone else is out of the picture except the United States and Great Britain. So the British are like, it is ours. America's like, no, it is ours. So we got this guy named James K. Polk, who runs for president. And he's one of the only U.S. presidents that's campaign slogan is war. James K. Polk says, 5440 or fight. What that means is that we will take, if you elect me, we will take Oregon Territory all the way up to 54 degrees, 40 minutes north latitude. I'll show you in a map in just a minute uh, what Polk is saying we will fight for. He's threatening the British. If I win the U.S. presidency, we're going to go to war over Oregon Territory. This is America putting on its big boy pants and threatening conflict over a piece of land. The British are like, we don't want to fight. We can come up with a solution. So in 1849, we split the territory with the British. So this is a picture of James K. Polk. Probably, if you look up here, of all U.S. presidents, would you say the best mullet? It's not a good mullet, but none of them really have good mullets. So, yeah, I give him that. But this is Polk. Americans like him because this is a time in our history where we're starting to kind of feel like the tough guy. The British aren't going to push us around. In fact, they're not going to fight for the western part of North America. They're too far away. So Polk is saying, elect me, and we will take Oregon Territory all the way up here. Here's the, the regular boundary of the the British claimed Oregon Territory all the way down to 42 degrees north latitude. So we're fighting over this. 
So eventually, we're going to sit down with the British, and I think folk maybe do this. His negotiation skills or his skills for compromise were sort of like what I've talked to you about. Do you want to stay out till 10? You ask for 11, your parents say 9, you negotiate for 10. So I think Pope was saying 5440, not necessarily expecting that we would actually achieve 54 degrees, 40 minutes north latitude. The British are like, whoa, 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 slow your roll, President Pope. We don't want to go to war, and you don't want to go to war. Wars are bad. Lots of us are going to die. What if, you know, let's just say we give you this, you give us this, and, and let's just make a nice, clean northern border of the United States. And James K. Polk is like, okay. That's why the boundary of the United States is nice and smooth all the way across. So we gave them this, they gave us this, and that was the negotiation. Pretty simple back then. So uh, we are quickly beginning to fulfill our manifest destiny to control North America from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. That's probably a good spot for me to stop today. So Texas has uh, fought for and won its independence. It's asked to be annexed. We've taken Oregon territory from the British. America is growing. America is becoming more confident in itself and probably start to become a threat to much of the rest of the world because of that confidence and that newfound power. Any questions today before I shut down? Anything from your study guide that's popping up that you're not really sure of doing over it or if you can clarify? William Travis was the guy that was in charge at the Alamo, a young man that was in charge at the Alamo. He was the boss. Good question. Any others you need help with that we've gone over? Okay. I'm going to shut off my video here for my uh, people that are absent. And uh, if there's any other questions, I'll